start with section 5.1. Polynomials is what we're dealing with. Polynomial functions in this case. So polynomial function is a function, uh, has coefficients a sub n and then a to the or x to the nth power and then you have another coefficient and it's a big bunch of fancy word you know notation stuff to get us a polynomial uh doesn't you know hope make a whole lot of sense there you start putting some numbers in there uh but the the a sub n's are just number coefficients the n's are just the exponents uh, and we go um you know, a sub n, uh, those are real number exponents, or real number coefficients. And then n are non-negative integers. So no fraction exponents or anything dealing with that in this particular section or chapter uh, out of that. All right, so there's some rules to being a polynomial. To be a polynomial, or not to be a polynomial. No negative or non-integer exponents. What's non-integer? What's an example of something that's not an integer? Fraction would be a good example, like a one half exponent or a square root as an exponent, something weird like that. Nothing weird happening here if you're going to be a polynomial. Uh, first three sections that we'll be covering tonight, we're dealing with polynomials only. Uh, so, no rational expression with variables or variable. In the denominator. Example of that, we like if you had a function x squared plus 5x minus 7 over x plus 4, that's not a polynomial. Doesn't mean it's not a function, it just means it's not a polynomial function. Uh, and we'll we'll deal with the rational stuff in this chapter, just not tonight. Uh, that'll be where we'll focus mostly next week uh, with the rational things. But a lot of the stuff we do tonight will uh, directly affect what we can do with the the rational things. Okay, uh, domain of a polynomial. Is from negative infinity to positive infinity because you don't have any non-integer exponents and you can't have an x in the denominator so there are no way that if it's a polynomial function there can be any red flags so it's always that default uh, domain for polynomial functions okay uh, the degree of a polynomial a lot of definitional stuff here this first section the degree of the polynomial that's the highest exponent on a variable our variable will likely be x most of the time so highest exponent on the x is going to be your degree um so we'll stake the degree on on some polynomials um we're gonna play this game first is the function a polynomial if so Take the degree. All right, so we'll start with this one. F of x, 3x to the fourth, minus 5x cubed, 2x squared, plus 6x minus 7. So is it a polynomial? So the things we're looking for to make it not a polynomial would be exponents that are not integers. 
or our negative exponents. We don't have any negative exponents. I don't see any fractions as exponents, so that's okay. And then no x is in a denominator. Uh, we don't have that any fractions in the problem, so there's no x in the denominator either. So this would be a polynomial. So yes, degree is the highest power of x. What's the highest power of x? Four. So it's a fourth degree polynomial. And we're going to learn some things about what, what does that mean about the problem, how many answers does it mean it has when we're looking for zeros, how many, uh, what's the end behavior based on knowing it is degree four, uh, or especially that it's an even degree uh, out of that. Okay. Sample B, same game. Is it a function? Is the function a polynomial? If so, what's the degree? Um, uh, g of x is equal to 6x to the 5th minus 5x to the 1 half. Is that a polynomial? No. And I'm just going to circle that part. That's the reason. You've got a fraction exponent. You can't have that. Example C. Let's go up here on the side. f of x is equal to the cube root of x. And this is kind of in disguise of whether or not that's a polynomial or not. Is it a polynomial? Why or why not? The correct answer is no. The reason is the cube root, does anybody know what exponent the cube root really is? The one-third. It's a fractional exponent. Same reason there. Uh, and that's just if you remember that from Algebra 2 or, or some other Algebra class. You know, not necessarily something we're going to spend a ton of time looking at in this particular chapter, but we will later on, uh, of course. Okay. So no, and that's the reason right there, the one-third exponent. Okay? Uh, where they can kind of get you a little bit sometimes, playing the same game, is the function a polynomial? If so, state the degree is when they do something like this, they'll throw a, a function out there and say 2x to the third, and then x plus 4 squared. And and they'll they'll put that out there and say, okay, is that a polynomial? If so, what's the degree? Uh, so when I'm looking at that, I don't see any fraction exponents. I don't see any x's in the denominator. So it passes those rules about being a polynomial. So it's a yes, but where most people miss this one would be yes, and then they say the degree is 3. And I'm telling you that's incorrect. What would the degree be? And the key is realizing that what's going on between this piece and the x plus 4 squared, they're all multiplying together. So if you multiply that out, you would end up with a 2x to the third times something with an x squared on it, right? And there'd be some other gibberish out through here. We'll get to that gibberish later. But for the degree, we're looking for that leading term, that, that highest power of x. If I multiply these two together, that's going to be 2x to the what? Fifth, so the degree would be 5. And that's where they kind of catch you. They can get you on the, yeah, it's a polynomial. You got that, but then you got to make sure you get that degree correct uh, because that makes all the difference in, in what we're trying to, um, to build when we start breaking these polynomials down. Uh, one more of those, f of x, one-fifth x to the eighth x squared minus four, something like that. Is that a polynomial? Why does that not mess it up? It's not, it's not an exponent, and it's also not got what in the denominator? It's not got a variable in the denominator. So that, that one-fifth is in there to kind of, that's the kicker here, is to try to confuse you. Well, it's one-fifth. It's just a real number. It doesn't have an x in the denominator, so it's okay. And what would the degree be? Ten. That's correct, absolutely. So the degree is 10. That's what we're after there. Okay. Nothing incredibly difficult about that. All right, so let's let's start building some information stuff about polynomials of various types. Um, 
and I'm, we're going to recreate a table that's in your textbook. Uh, we're just going to recreate it in notes. I think it's worthy of spending some time to recreate that. It's on page 328 of this textbook. It's table one. But you got some information stuff here. You got things about a degree, uh, the form, and then they have a name. You know, get, get some sort of name. And then we'll we'll do a small sketch of the graph over here on the right. So if there's no degree or no degree, that's a function that looks like it just f of x is equal to zero. It doesn't even have a constant value. Just f of x equals zero. That's a, the zero function. A sketch of that graph because you got the coordinate plane there and it's just this y equals zero line it's it's on top of the x-axis it's just laying right on top of it that's that no degree when it's f of x equals zero if it's x f of x is equal to a number it has a degree of zero and we're going to call that a sub zero. That just means a sub zero just represents some number. It could be any number. Uh, as long as it's a real number, it's okay. It has, uh, and that, it's the constant function. And the graph of it looks almost identical to the zero function, except for wherever a sub zero is. If a sub zero is a positive number, you know, it's this horizontal line. You know, at that place, it's y equals horizontal line. Y equals a sub zero. Whatever number that is. So we had no degree, zero degree. Let's go to a first degree. A sub one of x times x plus a sub zero. In Algebra 1 class, we're talking about this right now, in my Algebra 1 class that I'm teaching, uh, it's y equals mx plus b. That's what that is. It's just in polynomial form when you write it with the a sub 1 and the a sub zero. That's the college level polynomial form. Uh, and that's just a linear function is all it is. Linear functions can have positive or negative slope. We'll we'll just draw a you know sketch of a positive slope. You know, y equals mx plus b. It's, it's going to look something like a straight line. Okay. No, it's a sub one, a sub one x, and then plus a sub zero. Sorry, I'll be better. Let's do this way. Area. That's a little bit better. Maybe not that better. And then you go to, to degree two. You're dealing with a polynomial a sub two x squared plus a sub one x plus a sub zero. That's a quadratic, which we saw some in chapter four. And a quadratic function is that parabola shape. Looks something like that. It could also flip over, be upside down, opening down, all those things there. So you got a quadratic equation is, is what we're dealing with there for degree two. Degree three we're dealing with a cubic function is what it's called. The cubic function, uh, depending on what all you know, what coefficients are in front of x squared and plain x, can change how you know how big the humps are in it. You got you know coordinate plane here. The cubic function looks something like this. You know, pick it up, move it around, stretch it out, you know, that sort of thing. 
uh, depending on the coefficients, change that. Uh, but it looks like that shape with the cubic. But notice the similarities in the end behavior between the cubic and the linear. That this one's got the left side pointing down, right side going up. This one does too, left side's going down, right side going up. There's an obvious difference in, the, in between. But because this is an odd degree, and so is the linear one, they're very similar in how they act on the ends. The middle part changes, but the end behavior is much the same. Uh, when we got a second degree, that's an even degree, it acts a lot like a fourth degree, or fourth degree acts a lot like it. That's the best way to put it. With degree four, you got a function a sub four of x to the fourth plus a sub three x cubed plus a sub two x squared plus one x. That's called a quartic. Is the is the official word? You're going to hear me say fourth degree polynomial. You'll instead of saying cubic all the time. You'll probably hear me say third degree polynomial, second degree polynomial instead of quadratic all the time. Just because that, I mean, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's just a name. Uh, kind of arbitrary what your folks decided to name you. So somebody could know what to call you. But the end behavior is much the same. The difference is all in the middle there. Uh, both ends point up here if it's a positive in front of the x to the fourth. Just like with the squared, it's similar in its action, but there's a lot more stuff that can happen in the middle. And that's where we'll, the details are in the middle there. Uh, we'll, we'll figure that kind of stuff out. Um, if you extended this table on to a fifth degree and a sixth degree, you would start seeing repetition of the end behavior. All the even ones look something like this. All the odd ones look something like this. It's just the higher the power, on the, the degree, the more humps it can have in the middle. That's the difference. Like a cubic has more humps in the middle than a linear because a linear has a degree one, so there's no, but cubic has a couple of changes of direction. Fourth degree, you got, you know, possibility of a hump there. If you went to a sixth degree, there would be a possibility of more humps in the middle there. That's, that's what happens uh, as far as that degree goes. Uh, so what we're going to look at, uh, First is the graph of some polynomial functions and get a good idea. And we're going to use the graphing calculator to help us graph these. There's no real merit to being able to draw a table, make a table and plug in X values and get a graph. You've got a graphing calculator. We're going to use that thing. So we're going to graph some polynomials first. And then we're going to build up to actually doing something with those and, and getting all these pieces out of that in the next couple of sections of this. So graph, example number f, f of x is one half x minus one to the fourth power. What degree is that polynomial? Fourth degree. So we look at that and say, okay, I got an idea about what it's supposed to look at based on that table that we just drew. You've got a picture in your head. What do you think it's supposed to look like? Let's get what it actually does look like. So with my graphing calculator, one half parentheses x minus one raised to the fourth. And I see a graph that looks something like my fourth degree from that table. It doesn't have as many humps in the middle. But that's because of, you know, just the, the coefficients on those other pieces uh, that happen there. But we get that picture happening uh, from there. So I'm going to copy and paste that to my notes. That's what it looks like. Just the idea. And you can see it touching the x-axis at a certain spot. We're going to talk about what that means and where that's coming from. All those things happening. We see it's pointing up in both directions. The same ends are both going the same direction. That matters um, when it comes to that stuff. Um, again, looking at the graph of this function, x minus 1 squared x plus 3. What's the degree of this polynomial? 
Try again. Three. Because the first piece, if you multiply it out, it'd be x squared, right? And then you got to multiply by the, the other one, so that'd be x cubed. So this is degree three. That might be worth uh, knowing. And then look at the graph of it and see what's happening. So I'm just going to put in... How about turning? I want to change the color of that. All right, so parentheses x minus one squared parentheses x plus three. So here we see a, a very good representation of a cubic function uh, there that some nice changes in directions about that. Notice where's it crossing the x axis? Looks like right there's negative three, and then right here's positive one. How does that relate to the, the factors that are written there? Yeah, if you had set them equal to zero, you'd get those numbers. So we start seeing that correlation go together that if we can break a polynomial down, we can get there. So. Mm -hmm. The fourth degree. It, no, it, it, because the, the middle pieces are a little bit different. Depending on the coefficients on the x cubed, the x squared, and the plain x, how many of those little w looking shapes would be in there just because that that one is the particular polynomial that it is it doesn't have the little humps in the middle and it really doesn't sometimes the zoom does affect that but it doesn't on that one it just happens to be that way and we'll look at some more in, in a second you'll start seeing a lot of things happen there okay all right so one of the things that we talked about in chapters three and four was transformations uh, describing some transformations based on uh, a general idea about describe the transformation. On a function. Uh, let's just use the cubic one for an example. Let's say we're, we're wanting to... if. If we had the original cubic graph, and then they did this to it, x plus 1 cubed minus 4, what transformations are happening here? So left, right, up, down, stretch, compression, that sort of stuff. Okay, yeah, that's good. 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 Vertical stretch by a factor of two. Again, anything happening on the outside is going to be a vertical happening uh, plus or minus. So minus four is down four. The left one on the inside is the opposite on the inside of the parentheses. And then the vertical stretch is the multiplication happening on the outside. Uh, out of that. So go back and review some of your um, your things about transformations. And it, that works for no matter what polynomial you're dealing with. If you're dealing with f of x equals x cubed, the same transformation rules follow it. If you're dealing with x to the 17th power, the same transformation ideas about moving left, right, up, down, vertical stretch, compression, all are the same here. Nothing changes no matter what polynomial you're starting with. Uh, so that that's pretty generic for the whole thing. All right, let's uh, let's take this polynomial f of x equals five parentheses x minus two x plus three squared and then two x minus three cubed. All right, what we want to do is describe the zeros. Of the polynomial another word for zeros 
X intercepts. Depending on how old your algebra teacher was, uh, they may have said the words roots. They mean the same thing. Roots, zeros, X intercepts, all the same thing. Uh, we tend to roots has kind of been dropped in the in the higher ed world uh, recently, in the last ten years. So zeros and x-intercepts is what you'll hear me saying most of the time. I learned it roots, so if I slip back into old habits, sorry, it's the same thing. So, all right. So describing those zeros, x-intercepts are going to be where the whole thing is equal to zero. And the great thing about this problem is it's already I don't know, x minus two and then x plus 3 squared and 2x minus 3 cubed. The zeros happen when the whole thing is set equal to zero. That's where the x-intercepts happen. It's when y is equal to zero. So we set the entire problem equal to zero and solve it. If it's already in factored form like this is, then those individual factors are easily set equal to zero to, to figure that out. Well, I'm going to get rid of the 5 first. And then that allows me to take x minus 2, set it equal to 0, take x plus 3, set it equal to 0, and then take 2x minus 3 and set it equal to 0. When I solve those, I get the x-intercepts. But there's something else, because what did I drop off of each factor? or two of the three factors there, the exponents. Those exponents tell you the multiplicity of that, okay? What's the exponent on the x minus two up here? If there's nothing written there, it's a one. So that x equals two only happens with the multiplicity of one. The x equals negative three has a multiplicity of two. That comes from the exponent that was on, on its factor. And then the three over two has a multiplicity of three. And that comes from the exponent that's on that factor. Now, how does that relate to the graph that we were looking at earlier? When you, when you graph that, so let's graph that polynomial. Go back to the original, 5, parentheses, x minus 2, parentheses, x plus 3, squared, parentheses, 2x minus 3, cubed. When I graph that, we'll see some things happening that we'll need, need to know about. All right? Now... Pretty skinny looking graph, look, you know, deal there. Uh, if I hit trace and type in a two, notice that's where it's crossing the x-axis to get y equals zero. That that's true. That's what I found. So the multiplicity on that was one. Any odd multiplicities cross the x-axis. That's something you need to know for sure. Odd multiplicities. crosses the x-axis. So at positive 3 over 2, if I hit trace and type in 3 over 2, that's, that's that spot. That's where it's crossing the x-axis. That's an odd multiplicity. Notice how you see it going through there. Uh, my other... Mul uh, is negative three. Let's see what's going on there. What's happening here is our polynomial. If I zoom, zoom in just a little bit here. I'll zoom in over here, so you can see there's actually a polyn. The graph is there. You just can't see it. See, I drew that line in there. It's so skinny at that point, the resolution on the calculator can't draw it, uh, but it's there. We know it's there from the factor uh, that shows up that at negative 3, we have a multiplicity of 2. What's happening there, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit more um, to show you what's happening on the x-axis there.
is it's bouncing off the x-axis or touching it. Maybe maybe the better way of saying that. Man, I'm going too far down. Right there, that that little tick mark there is is the negative three. What's happening is that graph is coming down and bouncing off of the x-axis there. Even multiplicities bounce off the x-axis. That's what we need to gather out of this, that even multiplicities bounce off the x-axis. You might, you might see that your textbook maybe use the word touch the x-axis. They don't go through it. Odd multiplicities go through it. Even multiplicities bounce off. They're going to be touching the x-axis at a certain spot. Okay, That's important to know for when we start finding them. You know, we can see that happening on, on a graph, and that can help us when we start breaking down a polynomial by knowing that. We know that helps us know when when things can be used more than once, okay? So we're looking for zeros, we're looking for the x-intercepts, we're looking for where that thing is touching the x-axis or crossing the x-axis. That's what we're looking for, okay? Next thing we want to talk about is turning points. One of the easiest things, turning points. Polynomials. of degree n have at most n minus 1 turning points. Okay. So to find how many turning points something has, you just take the degree and subtract 1 from it. And that's how many possible turning points it is. It's not exactly how many it does have. It's how many it could have. That's all we're after here is possibilities, okay? So example to go with this is if you had a function f of x equals x cubed plus 3x squared minus 5x plus 4. And they ask this question, how many possible Turning points does f of x have? These are the questions you should not miss. What's the degree of f of x? Turning points 3 minus 1, 2. Notice, I'm not asking you to find the turning points. That's a little bit more difficult with algebra. Uh, if this was a calculus class, turning points are really easy to find using some calculus. It's not as easy with algebra. Uh, calculus really makes it easy to, to find those. But how many turning points could you have? It's degree minus one. That's all you got to know for turning points, degree minus one. Nothing really complicated about that at all. And there are a few questions that ask that. I've seen that on the final more than once for 140. Something really, really simple. It's a little obscure because it's just this one little fact that really you don't do much with. But I've seen it on the final a couple of times uh, since I've been teaching 140. So, and that's been, we won't say how many years. So, uh, All right. Now, let's start doing some algebra and then get into to really – doing some work. So we're going to start by building polynomials. We're still in section 5.1. So we're going to build the polynomial and they're going to tell us the zeros 1, negative 2, and 3 and the degree is 3. All right. So if we're going to build a polynomial and they give us the zeros and the degree, all we've got to do is take those zeros and turn them into factors. So if we're going to build that polynomial, if 1 is a 0, what was the factor that 1 came from? Negative 1, x minus 1. 
if negative two is a fact is a zero, the factor was positive two. Yeah, x plus two. Swap the sign. That's all you're doing here. X minus one, x plus two, and x minus three are the factors. Okay. That's not the standard form for a polynomial. That's the the intercept form for a polynomial. We want to put it in standard form. So we've got to multiply this out. Just basic. Algebra 1 stuff here. It doesn't matter which two you do together first. Whichever ones you think are the easiest. I'm a right to left kind of person. I don't know why. I just That's the way I've always done it. Uh, and I start with the two on the furthest right, multiply them together, get their answer, and then multiply those by x minus 1. Is the way I do it. If you wanted to multiply x minus 1 and x plus 2 together first, that's absolutely fine, and it doesn't change the final answer. So pick whichever way you want to do it. I'm going to do it this way just because that's kind of the way I've always done it and I've seen most professors doing it. All right, so distribute x times x, x times negative 3. And then distribute 2. That would be 2x to negative 6. And when I put those together, it's going to be x minus 1 times x squared minus x minus 6. I always simplify before I multiply again. Just because it's already long enough. If you don't simplify in the middle of it, it's even longer. So just simplifying as I go. And then I'm just distributing the x minus 1 to all of those terms. So I'm distributing x. So that'd be x cubed, negative x squared, and negative 6x. And then when I distribute the minus one, and this is a little, maybe it's not a, it's not really a trick. It's just a way of organizing your work that can save you a little bit of headache. I stack it up with like terms in the same column instead of writing it out long ways. That it just makes it quicker at the end. Negative one times negative x would be positive x, and then positive six. And then when I put it together at the end. I just got x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x plus 6. That's my polynomial in standard form. Now, you may have heard FOIL method growing, you know, in, in your algebra classes uh, up here at the top, you know, where we're multiplying these two together. That's FOIL method if you learned it that way. I don't. Foil method. Uh, I had a professor in college that taught me out of it. Um, he came from California. They didn't teach foil method in California. They taught algebra, but they didn't teach foil method. And I'm like, well, how do you even do it then? And it's just distributed property, is all it is. So you just distribute one piece at a time. That's and it works. And that way, foil method only works for binomial times a binomial. So you don't teach a you know one job tool. You have a distributed property works for everything, so just do it distributed property and call it that, and you never have to learn individual methods out of that. Key to this is changing the sign when you make your factors. If you don't change the sign when you make your factors, it's going to mess up. Right? No, no question about that. All right. Um, let's look at another one that that throws in the multiplicity ideas. If it gave us the zeros. Negative 3, and then they say in parentheses, multiplicity of 2, and then 5. And then they say the degree is 3. Well, when I build that polynomial, what's the factor that goes with negative 3? What's the factor, though? x plus 3, and the multiplicity of 2 means it needs what? Squared. Yeah, good job. And then the factor that goes with the 5, x minus 5. So there's the factored form of that. The multiplicity, all it does is tells you what the exponent's got to be. That really is all it does. And then what's it mean to square x plus 3? Yeah, multiply by itself. And then for this one, 
I would multiply these two together first, just because it's, you know, that there's a shortcut to that, I know. But it's x squared plus 6x plus 9. Because you square the first term, square the last term, and then multiply them together and double it in the middle. If you just did distributed property, it works the same way. It's not going to change again. And then, then I just need to multiply it out from there. So x times all of that would be x cubed, 6x squared, 9x, negative 5x squared, or negative 30x, and then negative 45. And that's just stacking it, but doing distributed property with the x. So this top row is x times all that. And then the bottom row is negative 5 times all that. And then I just stack it with the like terms together. And get a final answer. x cubed plus x squared minus 21x minus 45. Keep in mind, guys, that you can graph this final answer and the original factored form. If you graph both of them, they should lie right on top of each other in the graph. If they don't, you mismultiplied somewhere or misadded. So it's always a checking point that you can graph the final answer and then the factored form to, just to make sure you multiplied it together correctly. Uh, and if you if you don't if they don't line up, then something's wrong one way or another, where you're multiplied with, or maybe you just typed it in wrong uh, out of that. Okay, so building polynomials based on degree and the zeros that they give us, uh, the easy version of that. We'll get to the harder version of that later. Okay, so that's section 5.1. Uh, let's go ahead and, and jump into section 5.2. Finding real zeros. Of a polynomial. All right, a couple of skills we need to work on here uh, before we get into doing this. Uh, one of those is long division, and the other one is synthetic division. So let's do a quick example of long division, and then we'll do synthetic division. Which synthetic is the one we'll use the most. And then long division is useful later on in the chapter, i.e. next week when we do rationals. Uh, Got to be able to do long division for that, so that's why we do it. If I'm going to take x cubed minus 4x squared minus 5 divided by x minus 3, that's what we're doing here. We're taking a polynomial and dividing it by another polynomial. Long division style, I'm going to put the x minus 3 on the outside, and then do my division symbol, and I'm going to put the other po the front polynomial on the inside. So that's x cubed minus 4x squared. And here's where we've got to take care of the missing pieces. The degree of the first polynomial is 3, right? So you've got to have a representative for x cubed x squared, plain x, and then no x's. So if there's not a plain x, that's like what is there? Zero x is there. And then a minus five is still there. So that gets you a representative on the inside. Technically, you need to do that on the outside as well if they're asking you to divide by something that's not just a nice linear term, you know, linear piece there. Um, now, when you're doing long division, uh, the leading term is the only ones that matter. Uh, so you're looking at x and saying, what times x gets me x cubed? x squared. And then you distribute. x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times negative 3, negative 3x three squared. Parentheses and subtract. When I subtract x cubed minus x cubed, they cancel. Negative 4x squared minus negative 3x squared is negative 1x squared. Okay. Key, look at the leading coefficient or 
leading piece. What times this gives me that? That's x squared. Notice I put it above the x squared part of my, my dividend here. Right? And then subtract, always parentheses and subtract. I've seen people try to take the shortcut and just change the signs. And they always double change one or don't change one. So I always just do parentheses of subtraction. Negative 4 minus negative 3 is negative 1. X squared. Then we bring down the next term. So plus 0x. Bring that down. Again, I go back to the front. What times this x gives me negative 1x squared? Negative 1x. So I'm going to put minus 1x up here. And then I'm going to distribute that negative 1x to this x minus 3 in the front. So always, always distribute. So that would be negative 1x squared and then positive 3x. Parentheses, subtract. These cancel. That's what should happen. And then I'm left with 0 minus positive 3 is negative 3x. Bring down the minus 5. And then I go back to the front. What times x gets me negative 3x? Negative 3. So I need a minus 3 up there. Distribute, 3x, positive 9, parentheses, subtract. These cancel just like we planned. Negative 5 minus 9. Negative 14. This is the remainder. The way we write the remainder with polynomial division is we write it plus negative 14 over the divisor, what I divided by. Division, long division, again, it's not, not the real focus of this particular lesson. We're going to use synthetic most of the time for us for this particular, but we've got to have seen long division before. Uh, and it works pretty nicely. Uh, that remainder is the key. That remainder, uh, if it's a zero, it means a certain thing. If it's not a zero, then it doesn't mean anything, really. Uh, let's look at example B and use, show you synthetic division. Your book, I think, actually uses the word synthetic substitution. I've always called it synthetic division. Uh, it's the same thing. Okay, so if you see synthetic substitution, you know, it's synthetic division. It's the same thing. If I'm going to divide f of x equals x cubed minus 4x squared minus 5 by g of x, x minus 3. Okay, it's the same problem we did for a, but I'm going to do it with synthetic division instead of long division. Synthetic division works beautifully for dividing by linear terms. And x minus 3 is a linear factor. Okay, If that's an x squared plus 4x minus 7, you cannot do uh, synthetic division with it. It works great for linear factors, and that's, that's what, what we're going to use it for. Okay, Now, the way I set up my synthetic is I draw this little box like that. And then on the inside, I'm going to put the coefficients for the polynomial I'm dividing into, the dividend, okay, what I'm dividing into. So that's 1, negative 4. There's that 0 again from, from before, and then a minus 5. And then I put a little shelf on the outside, okay? That little shelf on the outside is where I'm going to put my divisor or what I'm dividing with. To get that divisor, you want to set x minus 3 equal to 0 and solve it. 
what's it do to it? Changes the sign. Keep that. That's that's what it should do. Okay. So we're going to put a positive three on the shelf there. And that's our divisor. That's what we're dividing with into that other polynomial. Notice there's no X's or anything on, on there anymore. Now, the, the difference in synthetic division and long division is one, no variables to worry about. Two, addition instead of subtraction. Addition is always easier than subtracting, right? Because it, when you're subtracting, you can do that minus negative thing and that always gets confusing. So addition is easier. So synthetic division uses addition instead of subtraction. The first step for synthetic division is always drop the first one down. Drop the one down and then multiply. One times three is three and that goes to the next spot. Then add. What's negative four plus three? Negative one. Multiply. Negative one times three. Negative three. Add. Zero plus negative three. Negative three. Multiply. Negative nine. Add. Negative five plus negative nine. Negative 14. This guy is still the remainder. What was the remainder when we did long division? Negative 14. It's the same. What that does, the synthetic division breaks the polynomial down by one degree. So we divided by something that had degree one. So anytime we do synthetic division, it breaks the polynomial down by one degree. It started as x cubed. Now these things in that row are the coefficients of the new polynomial that's one degree less. So that's x squared minus x minus three plus negative 14 over x minus three. The exact same answer that I got by doing long division. I get the same thing by synthetic division. And I don't have to worry about distributive property and all the x's and x squareds and the subtraction of a negative and all that stuff involved. So the synthetic division really, really makes, makes that happen much more efficiently. Okay. Now, we're going to utilize synthetic division to break down polynomials. There's a thing called the factor theorem that we're going to paraphrase. X minus C is a factor of a polynomial. Spell polynomial. If and only if F of C equals zero. What that means is if the remainder when I do synthetic division is zero, then that's a factor of the polynomial. That's what that means. If the remainder is zero, then the what I divided by is a factor of that polynomial. Okay? So, let's let's test that with some examples here. Example C is x minus 1 a factor of f of x equals 2x cubed minus x squared plus 2x minus 3. The way to test that is do synthetic division. So I set x minus 1 equal to 0, solve it, that gets me what goes on the shelf. Positive 1 goes on the shelf. And I run that through with synthetic division. Drop the 2, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. That remainder is 0. That means x minus 1 is a factor of f of x. Here's what happens to our polynomial. x minus 1 is a factor. What's left over, what does synthetic division do to the original polynomial? It breaks it down by 
one degree. We started with an x cubed. This is now 2x to the second plus 1x plus 3. So that's the other part here. By doing that synthetic division and getting a 0, we've taken a polynomial and broken it from a cubic or third degree polynomial into one little linear piece and then a quadratic piece. And because that's quadratic, oh, I can find some other things about that because I know a lot of stuff about quadratics. I know I can factor it or I can do quadratic formula. Uh, all of those things happen with quadratics. So by breaking that down with synthetic division is what we're trying to do there. Okay. Now, let's kind of escalate that into what we're really trying to do in the first half of Chapter 5, and that is find all the possible rational zeros and factor f of x equals 2x cubed plus 11x squared minus 7x minus 6. So that's our polynomial. Now, the possible rational zeros, there's a whole theorem about this that you can read in your textbook if you want to read a boring theorem. Uh, but basically what it gets is this P over Q list. P and Q are these numbers. The constant on the end and the leading coefficient, the number in front of the highest power of X. P is the number constant on the end. Q is the leading coefficient, the number in front of the highest power of X. What are the factors of 6? So what's that mean? 2 and 3 are factors of 6. 1 is also a factor of 6. And 6 is a factor of itself. Technically, it's plus or minus in front of all of those. Just save a little hint. You know, work, and they're just right plus or minus in front of all that. And then on the bottom, we want factors of Q. And Q in our problem here is 2. The factors of 2 are 1 and 2, right? That's it. So we've listed those factors. Now we need to build the list of possible rational zeros. 1 divided by 1 is 1. 2 divided by 1 is 2, 3 divided by 1 is 3, 6 divided by 1 is 6, and then divide them all by 2. That's 1 half. 2 divided by 2 is 1. We've already got one listed. 3 divided by 2, I don't have that listed yet. What's 6 divided by 2? 3. We've already got 3 listed. So plus or minus in front of all of those. That is my list of possible rational zeros. So what I've done is I've taken this polynomial based on the constant on the end and the leading coefficient. I've taken that polynomial and I've said, okay, instead of every possible rational number that exists, I've narrowed down the list of possible rational zeros to these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 12 answers. These are the only 12 rational zeros that could work for this one. Doesn't mean all 12 of them will work. How many could work? How many zeros could there be for this polynomial? Three, because the degree is three. That, that, so they could all be rational. They could not be rational, but at most three of them are going to work. And this arrows down my list. Now, that will be on the final. I can promise you from the bottom of my heart, it's on every 140 final that they ever give since 1997 when I took it. Okay, so that makes me a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, that, that was on that final. It's been on every one of them since. A question that just asks you to make that list. That's on your Canvas quiz. That's on your real test for Chapter 5. It's going to be on there. Be able to do that. All right? And we're going to do that with most every problem. Now, here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. You're not going to plug in every one of those and check them. When, back when I took college algebra, the graphing calculator wasn't as, as you know, easily accessible, much more expensive than it is now. 
uh, and they didn't require it for the course. So you had to do everything by hand. So you really did have to check those. I'm not asking you to do that. What I want you to do is graph the, the doggone polynomial with your graphing calculator and look at it. I'm going to hit zoom six to get back to the regular window. And I'm going to go to y equals and I'm going to type in that polynomial. I said it was. There we go. 2x to the third plus 11x squared minus 7x minus 6. We'll hit graph. Do I see that thing crossing the x axis anywhere? Where? All right, so negative one, two, three, four, five, negative six. And then there's positive one there. There's also one right here. I'm not sure what that one is. Uh, it's in between zero and negative one. So I'm thinking, okay, what fractions do I have between zero and negative one? Negative one half. So it's possibly that. So what I want to do is check one of those. I'm just going to start with the negative six. That's the first one you, you guys said. It doesn't matter which one you pick first. I'm going to use negative six first. And the way to check it with your calculator is just hit trace and then type in the number negative six and hit enter. What does it tell me the y value is? Zero. That's the right number then. That's the one I want to start with on synthetic division. So I'm going to break this polynomial down with synthetic division using a negative six. Two. 11, negative 7, negative 6. And I'm going to run negative 6 through with synthetic division. So 2, notice the remainder is 0. It better be. If it's not, something went wrong. Okay? Now, <coughs> what's that do to the polynomial? It takes the polynomial and says, okay, we got a factor of x minus 6, or excuse me, x plus 6. And then the other factor right now is 2x squared minus x minus 1. I think I can factor that quadratic. And I think it should factor as, you know, a couple of nice pieces. If I try to factor it, negative 2, negative 1, it would be negative 2 and 1. So it'd be 2x squared minus 2x plus 1x minus 1. And I group 2x in common, 1 in common. So the factors that go from that quadratic, I've got x plus 6. That was the one that I used synthetic division with. Then I have 2x plus 1 and x minus 1. That's the factored form for that polynomial. Where else did it cross the x-axis at? Negative one half. What would that be if you set it equal to zero? That, that ties together. Definitely no coincidence. And then it also crossed at positive one, didn't it? That would be positive one if you set it equal to zero. Okay? So we're building the factored form. We just got to have some somebody to knock the first domino over with synthetic division to break that polynomial down. You want to break a polynomial down until it gets to be a quadratic. Uh, so if you had a third degree like this one, you do synthetic once, and then you work with the quadratic. If you had something that's fourth degree, you're going to do synthetic division twice, and then that'll get you two factors, and then a quadratic, and you can work with the quadratic after that. So that's the idea that we're trying to push through here. All right? Um, let's look at example... E. f of x, let's do a fifth degree, really big one. x to the fifth minus x to the fourth minus 4x four cubed plus 8x squared minus 32x plus 48. We want to factor and find the real zeros. Okay. Now, B 
big polynomial. Lots going on. Let's go ahead and get that practice of the P over Q list for this one. Uh, it's not a huge list, but it's not a hard one to find either. Okay. So what's P in that problem? 48. And Q is 1. That makes the list really easy because you only got plus or minus 1 on the bottom. So you really only have the factors of 48. What are the factors of 48? 1 and 48 and 24. 3 goes into 48. How many times? 16. 4 goes into 48. And then 5 doesn't go into 48. 6 goes into 48. Eight times, and that's the factors of 48. Okay. So make sure you get that exhaustive list. Now, are you going to try all of those? Absolutely not. What are you going to do next? Graph it, plug it into the calculator, find out where it's crossing the x-axis. We need it. We need how many places to use for synthetic division here? We got five possible zeros, real zeros. May not be all five that are real. There may only be three of them that are real. There may only be one of them that's real. But we need somebody to start with. So when I go to graph that, I need to put something on the shelf. So I've got one, negative one, negative four, eight, negative 32, and 48. So there's my polynomial ready for synthetic. I just need to know what goes on that shelf. So I'm going to go to y equals, and I'm going to put in that polynomial, x to the fifth minus x to the fourth minus 4x to the third plus 8x squared minus 32x plus 48. And I just need somebody to start the party. What's going on here? That graph looks a little different. It's touching the x-axis at what number? Two. What's that mean about the multiplicity for two? It's an even multiplicity. So that two is going to work either twice or four times. We're not sure. So that means I could use two as the number on the shelf for my synthetic. I could use it twice, and it should work. I could also use negative three for that. It doesn't matter which one you start with. I'm gonna start with the negative three because I'm a left to right kind of person uh, and just use the negative three and get it out of the way. Negative three on the shelf and run that through with synthetic. There's the remainder of zero. Okay. Now, that broke my polynomial down from an x to the fifth degree to x to what degree? Fourth. So the red line down here, this one right here, that's fourth power. I'm going to do synthetic again on that with what number? Two. Because I know it, the original polynomial crossed the, or touched the x-axis and it bounced off at 2. So I'm going to use 2 right there. And that worked. Now, I know what about the multiplicity for 2 again? It's even, right? So if I run a 2 on the shelf again, it should work again because it bounced off the x-axis. So that means it's even multiplicity. So we got it, we can use it again. So <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's, that's exactly the, <coughs> Right. That's exactly what we're doing is breaking it down as much as possible. 
before we have to do maybe some grunt work to get the last two zeros. So I'm going to run two through again, and that zero, and that's uh, zero, and that's four, and that's eight. And there we, there we have the remainder of zero. So, so far, this is what I have, the factored form of the polynomial. I've got x plus three. I've got x minus two. And I've got another x minus two. And then I've got this little jewel right there. What's that? Plus four. There you go. Now, there's the factored form. Will this factor any further? No. If it were a minus sign in the middle, yes, it'd be x plus two, x minus two. You're right there. But because it's a plus sign, that won't factor any further. So how do I get all the zeros then for this polynomial? I set each of those factors equal to what? Zero. So x plus 3 equals 0. That's getting me x equals negative 3. And x minus 2, that gets me x equals 2. x minus 2 again gets me x equals 2 again. But x squared plus 4 equal to 0. Ooh, what happens there? True. And so it's not a real solution. The square root of both sides, you're right, is the imaginary part of the complex number system. What's the square root of negative 4? Plus or minus 2i. We have 1, 2, 3 real solutions, and then 1, 2 complex solutions. Now, the instructions said find the real ones. These exist, but they don't show up on the graph. How many places did it touch the x-axis? Two, negative three, and then it bounced off at two. We saw it touching the x-axis. Then it didn't touch the x-axis anywhere else. The imaginary or the complex solutions not gonna show up on the graph. They exist. Now, here's the difference in section 5.2 and 5.3. 5.2, these don't matter. 5.3, they're back in the game. That's the only difference in those two sections out of the book. Is the 5-2 says real numbers only. 5-3 says, oh, guess what? Complex numbers still exist. Let's use them now. That's the only difference. You find the real ones first. The imaginary ones are the ones that are left over. The complex ones are the ones that's left over. So if you do the synthetic division this way, we're going to do a couple more examples before we run out of time. But the real ones, you get all of them because they show up on the graph, right? They're where it's hitting the x-axis. You're going to see those. Then whatever's left over should be a quadratic, and we can get the complex solutions through that quadratic. Here we got it by solving by square roots. If it was an x squared plus 4x minus 7, we could do quadratic formula and get the complex solutions out of it. We're going to see that as we do, do a couple more problems with this. Okay? All right, so there we found the real solutions. The factored form, there's our factored form. And then here are our real solutions. And then this is complex. All right. Now, let's do just a few or a couple of problems here from Section 5.3 and get that practice. So 5.3, all it does is adds the complex zeros. They come back in. That's the only difference. All right. So if we're going to find the zeros, find all zeros for the polynomial. That's the instructions. In section 5.2, it says find the real zeros of the polynomial. In section 5.3, it says find them all. And that's, that's the only difference in the two sections. Uh, so let's start with this one. f of x is equal to 3x to the fourth power plus 5x to the third power, plus 25x squared, plus 45x minus 18. How many zeros should I be finding? Four. How many of them are real? 
and how many of them are complex? Do we know that? No, we don't know that. And it doesn't really matter. Now, here's the thing you've got to realize. Complex solutions are going to come in pairs. So there's, if there's complex solutions, there have to be an even number of them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that any of these are complex. We're going to look at it and see by doing all the same steps that we did for that last example we did. What's the first thing that I want to do? I want to run something through with synthetic. So I need to know what numbers to even try. So that P over Q list would be helpful maybe. So the factors of 18 are 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, and 18. What are the factors of 3, 1, and 3? So my P over Q list is all the factors of 18 and then every one of those divided by three. So one third, two thirds, three thirds, six thirds, nine thirds, 18 thirds. None of the, those are all repeats. So that, that's my P over Q list. The factors of 18 all divided by one and then the factors of 18 all divided by three. And it just adds those fractions, one third and two thirds. Because 3 over 3 is 1, 6 over 3 is 2, 9 over 3 is 3, 18 over 3 is 6. We already had those listed. Okay? So those are the possibilities. What's the next step? Graph it. Three x to the fourth plus five x to the third. Oops. To the third plus 25x squared plus 45x plus 18. Graph. All right. Where's it crossing the x-axis? What's a good one? Negative 2. That's a good one. Let's, let's use that one. Anytime I've got a choice... Uh, to not use a fraction, I'm going to use something that's not a fraction just because it makes it easier. Okay? So I'm going to run negative 2 through with synthetic division. Drop the 3 and multiply. Multiply. And there we go. Now, that broke my polynomial down from a fourth degree to a what? Third degree. Where else does it cross the x-axis? So there was the, the negative two. What could that possibly be? One third. Check it. With your, hit the trace button on your calculator up there at the top and then type in one third. And just to make sure that y is zero. That way I don't waste my time running a fraction through there. One third does work. So when I go to do my synthetic, use the one third. Don't make it, don't put a rounded decimal in there. It's gonna it'll really not work. Okay. So I'm gonna run it through with one third and do the math. So drop the three and multiply. It works out real nice in this problem. Like he planned it that way. And there we get the polynomial bro broken down to where we have the zeros, negative 2 and positive 1 third. And then what's left over here? We have a quadratic left over. And we can solve that using quadratic methods, either by square roots or quadratic formula works wonderfully. Uh, I don't think factoring will work on this case. Uh, but... I'm going to use square roots because it's uh, quick and easy. And I don't have a plain x in there. That's 3x squared equals negative 27. Divide by 3. x squared equals negative 9. Take the square root, plus or minus 3i. So we have plus or minus 3i. We have x equals negative 2. And x equals 1 third. Those are our zeros for that polynomial.
not. And we look at the graph, it touched the x-axis two places, and then we got two complex solutions that it didn't show up on the graph. That you got to keep that in mind. The complex stuff's not going to show up on the graph. The the real stuff does. Real solutions show up on the graph. Can I go to get my trace button? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I know you said the trace button and then you type in the. Yes, ma'am. Trace and then negative two, and hit enter. Tends to cause some problems sometimes when you get a plot turned on. Anybody else having calculator issues? Okay. All right. Let's do one more. And we'll see if we can build that polynomial after that. One more where we're finding the zero. So, we're again, find all the, all the zeros for this polynomial. X to the fourth plus 6X cubed plus 2x squared minus 26x plus 17. Pretty nice on this one because your p over q list is really short. What is the p over q list? And 1. It's everything's prime number. That, that works out really nice. Now, One six two negative twenty six seventeen. Where's it? Where's it hitting the x-axis? We're crossing it, or maybe not crossing it. X to the fourth. Six x to the third. Two x squared. Minus twenty six x plus. What's going on here? Bounces at one. So what's that mean about the multiplicity for one? It should be even, right? Two or four, right? So if I hit trace and one, just to verify, yeah, one works. So when I'm running my synthetic for one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to at least do it twice. And I'll try it a third time and see if it works, but I don't think it will, but... Well, not very often they work more than that. So one, and there's a remainder of zero. So my zero is over here. I've got x equals one, and then I know that the multiplicity for that should happen at least one more time. So I run synthetic with that one again because I don't have a quadratic yet. I've got a cubic now or a third degree. I want to get it down at least to a quadratic before I stop doing synthetic division. One, eight. And there I have a quadratic now. If I wanted to test the one again, because I know it should be an even multiplicity, it could be two or it could be four. I don't think it's four, but I can test that pretty quickly by just trying synthetic again with a one. And we see that the remainder is not zero. So we know that, that it stops at, at using it twice. So that has a multiplicity two. So x equals one happens twice. We're left with a quadratic left over. X squared plus 8X plus 17 equals zero. So we've got to solve that using quadratic methods. So things that you can use for a quadratic. Factoring is an option sometimes. Uh, quadratic formula is always an option. It works every time. Complete the square is an option. 
Solving by square roots is not an option on this one because you got a plain X term. So I always just do quadratic formula because it always works, it, no matter if it factors or not. Unless I just have factored that problem a, a billion times and I know it by heart that it's X plus four and X plus three. That this one's not. So I'm going to do quadratic formula. X equals negative B plus or minus radical squared minus four AC divided by two X. And plug in the stuff. A is one, B is eight, C is seventeen. And work that out to get the other two zeros of this polynomial. Negative eight plus or minus eight squared minus four times one times seventeen divided by two times one. B sixty four minus sixty eight, which would be negative four inside the so what's the square root of negative four? Two I simplify that. So that'd be x equals negative four plus or minus I. So our zeros are x equals one and negative four plus or minus i. And that's coming from the, the, the quadratic formula there. Yes, the negative four plus i is one of the answers. Negative four minus i is the, the fourth answer. Yeah, that's exactly right. Total should be four solutions though. Okay. Fairly, as long as you know how to do a quadratic at the end, you're, you're going to be okay. Uh, the synthetic part, I think, is the easiest part. The quadratics might be the, the tougher part. All right, uh, let's look at forming a polynomial. The last thing we got to do uh, for this. And that this is like what we did in the first section where I gave you the zeros and said the degree is three. The only difference is in this, you're going to get some complex zeros as well. Forming a polynomial. All right, so when you're forming a polynomial, they're going to tell you that it has degree three with zeros, negative five, and maybe the square root of six. What they don't tell you is that there's another zero hidden in the, this list of zeros. That through the complex conjugate theorem, that if the square root of six is a solution to the polynomial, then negative square root of six is also a solution to the polynomial. They don't tell us about this one. They didn't tell us. Okay, we've got to know that that happens. The same thing happens if they tell you that like four plus i is a solution. They're not that you've got to know that four minus i is also a solution. It's the complex conjugate. It's always with square roots and complex numbers. That's that's where that comes in play. Now, what that does is allows us to build a polynomial with the degree three. If it's degree three, we know we got to have how many factors to start off with? Three of them. One of the factors goes with the negative five. What's the factor for x equals negative five? Plus five, right? X minus the square root of six goes with the positive square root of six. X plus the square root of six goes with the negative square root of six. And then we need to multiply that together. It seems obvious to me which two need to be multiplied together first, right? Which ones? The square roots. Multiply those together first. If there's complex ones, we'll do an example with complex in a minute. Uh, do those together first because that will get rid of those I's and in this case, get rid of the square roots. So we're going to multiply these two together first. Just distributive property, just like before. X times X is X squared. That'd be X radical six 
And then this is negative x radical 6. And then negative square root of 36. So, yeah, and when we simplify that. When we simplify that, these two middle pieces, what happens to them? They go away. They cancel each other out. Gets rid of them. That's what we want to happen. And then this square root of uh, the negative square root of 36 would be x squared minus 6, right? Now I just need to multiply that part out. x times x squared is x cubed minus 6x plus 5x squared minus 30. Rewrite it in descending order. How can I check to make sure that that is the correct polynomial? Put, plug it in and graph it, and it should be crossing the x-axis where? Negative 5 and... Positive and negative square root of 6. We could check those places because those are real solutions, not complex. We would see it crossing the x-axis at those places uh, out of that. So there's always the check with the graph that can really help you a lot out of that. Okay? Not too bad. Let's do one with some complex in it. Make it a little bit more tough. All right. Example. All right. Degree three with zeros five and three minus two i. What's the zero they didn't tell me about? Three plus two i. Call that hidden. That's, they don't tell us about that one. We've got to come up with that one on our own. Now, with the complex, it makes the multiplication a little bit more difficult or longer. Uh, there are some shortcuts that you can take, but most people get just, just more confused with the shortcuts than they do just actually multiplying it out. So let's just get the factors going here. What are, what's the first factor? X minus 5. And then we would have X minus 3 minus 2i and x minus 3 plus 2i. And it really is that simple. You just want it's minus on both of them, and then 1's a plus, 1's a minus with the i part. Okay. Now, obviously, the two pieces with the complex numbers in them need to be put together first. So we're going to do that part first. And not going to get around. It's long. And a lot of places to make mistakes. But it's doable. I always just distribute and say x times x is x squared. x times negative 3 is negative 3x. x times 2i is 2ix. And then I go distribute a negative 3. That'd be negative 3x. And that'd be positive 9. And then I don't have a positive, a plain number there, so I'm just going to go down here plus 9. And then negative 3 times uh, positive 2i would be negative 6i. And then I'd distribute the negative 2i, which is negative 2ix. And then positive 6i. And then negative 4i squared. Notice how I've kind of stacked them up with like terms there. So this first row is the x times all of that. The second row is taking the negative 3 times all of that. And I just stacked it up with the like terms in columns. Okay. And then I need to simplify that. Well, here's the great thing. When I go to simplify that, the x squared is just going to come on down. What's negative 3x minus 3x? Negative 6x. What happens to these two guys? They cancel each other out. And then 
these two guys, they cancel each other out. Then we got the plus 9. He's still there. What is negative 4i squared? It'd be positive 4. No i left. Because remember, what's i squared? i squared is equal to negative 1. So that would be plus 4. And I still got the x minus 5. I got to deal with in a second. I'm going to simplify that one more step. x squared minus 6x plus 13. Then x minus 5. And then I'm going to distribute again. x cubed, 6x squared, 13x. And then distribute the 5. Negative 5x squared plus 30x minus 50 and, 5 and 15. Be negative 45. That's not right. Negative 65. All right. And then combine like terms. Last piece of the polynomial here. X cubed minus 11x squared plus 43x minus 65. And that polynomial. If we graph it, it should be crossing the x-axis at positive 5 and nowhere else. We can't check the complex with the trace function or calculator. It's not that smart. Uh, but we, we should be able to, to look at it and say, oh, okay, it crossed the x-axis at 5 and nowhere else, then I probably did it okay. okay. Takes a little practice doing the, the complex part, uh, definitely. Uh, with, when you're building those polynomials with the complex stuff. Uh, some problems that you might want to look at, page 347, 17 through 97, the odd ones on that page, page uh, 364, uh, 11 through 43, 51 through 67, odd on all those, and then page 371. Uh, Canvas quiz is out there for this. Um, same rules as always. Uh, do next Monday. We'll do uh, two more sections on Monday. Uh, next week, finish up Chapter 5, and then you'll have fall break to complete that next Canvas quiz and prep for the test. And I'll get you a, a, a review for Chapter 5 test next week so that you've got it for that two-week thing. And, and you can always email me questions about any of it over the next three weeks and we'll get ready for chapter five all right i appreciate you guys being here y'all have a wonderful evening and a good week if you got questions email me I'll, i'm uh pretty quick on on replying back so shoot me an email if you got something